I'm really excited about our next guest. Mary Kay Henry is the first woman president of the two million member strong Service Employees International Union. She was elected in 2010, and Mary Kay Henry is consistently listed as one of the top visionaries reshaping politics, the economy, and the future of work. She was just named to Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people of 2020. She's still cool anyway. Mary, Mary Kay, it's great, to, it's great to see you again. Um, let me, you know, we've, you, Steve. I wish we were in a room together, able to touch each other's arms. Exactly. Yeah. But we, I, I hear there's another side to this. But you know, you, 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 I mean, we are in the era of COVID. What has your dashboard? What has this done to so many of the issues you work on? From, you know, the, the workplace, dignity in the workplace, pay in the workplace. How, you know, getting people back to work so that they haven't. I mean, I'm just interested in how you as a leader of one of the nation's largest union is dealing in, with this time. Well, it has made the two million service and care workers that I'm proud to represent and the millions more fighting for 15 and a union uh, be incredibly uh, honored that the rest of the nation understands uh, what they've known all along is that they're essential. Uh, to the running of this economy. And so home care workers, nursing home workers, janitors, security officers, a lot of public service workers who've gone into state capitals and city halls to sleep on the floor and work 24 seven in order to process the amazing need uh, that people have because of the public health threats and the economic catastrophe that's falling so many families. That's the one thing. And then the second thing, Steve, is what is it meant for service and care workers all across the country, not just SEIU members, but the rest of the labor movement and throughout the economy. Uh, 64 million people, 100 million impacted is meant that we've had to bear too much grief. Hmm. Uh, that service and care workers are 78% women. Um, they are uh, black and brown. And you and I both know that the statistics are off the chart uh, for essential workers who this government did not provide personal protective equipment to from day one, even though in other countries around the world, when there's a federally coordinated response, um, the workers get the care they need and the curve gets flattened faster and the economy gets stabilized uh, for everyone. And that's just not the condition that essential workers have been facing. And for the millions that have a union, we've been able to, to collectively bargain, um, heroes pay uh, to make sure people have childcare assistance, temporary housing so they're not bringing the infection home to their families. That's the power of collective bargaining that's happened for hospital workers and nursing home workers, home care workers and airport workers and janitors. But it hasn't been the privilege of all workers. And that's why we're fighting so hard right now uh, to turn out the vote and make and link the fight that essential workers have had to care for themselves and their families with the fight to elect a, a government at every level that's going to make sure uh, that we get taken care of as working families. Mary Kay, one of the things that hit me last night watching the, um, the debate, if we can call that a debate, was the conversation about the president suspending, I guess you call it racial sensitivity training uh, uh, within, you know, throughout the government um, ranks. And, you know, his comments that, that the act of doing that was itself racist. And I, I'd love to get your, your insights and thoughts about that, because as you're trying to move the needle to create fairness and dignity across the board, you know, I just love to get an understanding from you about what that agenda needs to be and needs to look like to get this right. Yeah, I, one example of a key part of that agenda, Steve, is for the primarily black and brown women that do home care in this country. Um, Vice President Biden has put forward a plan that's called Build Back Better and actually recognizes women's work as critical to the revitalization of a new American economy that includes everybody. And so for the first time since the founding of our nation, home care providers, child care providers will be included 
as workers under the law, and they've been excluded since the beginning of time because of a racist compromise uh, where white Southern legislators didn't want black workers in the South to be included in the 30s protections, and therefore they were excluded. And so I think a key pushback to uh, the overt and the covert racism that was demonstrated by the current president last night is to directly talk about the historical exclusion of both women and people of color from the rights and guarantees of our democracy and economy. And Demetra Kaship in Wisconsin has been fighting for 20 years as a home care provider to move from subminimum wage work, 325 an hour, to right now she's at $11 an hour because of a minimum wage action by the Milwaukee City Council. And she's been blocked from going to 15 because of a, a state legislature that doesn't want to raise wages. And Scott Walker ended her union when he took office in 2010. And that's why how we vote in this election matters to both racial inclusivity and economic uh, equality for everyone in this nation. You know, you have uh, called for a new approach to organizing, which I find very intriguing. And if I have this right, it's called Unions for All. What would that, would, would that get around some of the, um, the blockages that you, you just identified? And, and can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, what we hope it does, Steve, is that it busts those blocks open. It doesn't work around. We've been working around the blocks for the last uh, 80 years. Um, and what it would do is say that all workers in this country deserve the right to decide whether they want to join a union and bargain wages, hours, and working condition, but also then be able to participate in every aspect of their lives that we think unions um, have to have voice in on stop and frisk and immigration and climate change and all the other things um, that are holding us back from every family getting an equal chance to thrive. And so that's a key part of Unions for All. Let's get everybody written in. The second thing is to say every tax dollar, federal, state, local, needs to finance living wage work that people can actually raise their families on and expect their children are gonna do better. And right now we have 64 million people working more than full time, two and three jobs, and living below poverty. Um, and that's just wrong. And as a government, we should not allow our tax dollars mm. uh, to finance poverty wage work. And we should call corporations to a civic table like the Business Roundtable has done by saying we can't just have shareholders as stakeholders, we have to recognize community and workers and government as part of the stakeholders in our corporations. And it would be great to see a major corporation in the U.S. like McDonald set a national bargaining table and bargain with their 800,000 workers and then get Wendy's and Burger King and all fast food workers to a common wage and benefit standard so we can raise the standard of living for 4 million people. And that would catalyze millions more getting out of poverty and into a life where everybody can realize the fullness of their human potential. Let me, let me ask you one question, Mary Kay, which is, you know, listening to you sounds so, sounds so interesting. President Trump and many of his base would listen to what you just said and said, this will be rampant left-wing socialism. What is the response that, that Americans that would like to find, I mean, you're, you, you're talking about working with the business roundtable. You know, you're talking about working with corporations, but what is the quick response to help folks to understand the, the distinction between true socialism and some of the progressive suggestions you're making? I would just ask uh, the listener, do you agree that somebody should work 80 to 100 hours a week and not be able to pay for food, housing, and education needs for their children. And most people don't think that's right. So the question then is, how do we fix it? And we think a key fix is workers being able to join together and bargain with their employers mm -hmm. at the point of decision where, the, uh, where wages and benefits get set. 
And in the case of fast food, it's at the corporate level. And that's why these companies in other countries around the world, whatever their um, sort of political ideology, th these companies uh, take wages and benefits out of competition and agree that all workers should earn a living wage, have health care, get paid sick time. Like no fast mm. work food in this country can take two weeks of paid sick time right now. So they're passing the virus around to each other because they can't afford to stay home and self-quarantine. Hmm. So I don't care what your political persuasion is. People agree in this nation, like close to 80 percent now, that the level of economic and racial inequality is not acceptable. And we aren't going to be able to restart this economy unless we intervene on poverty wage work and and wring it out of our system. We can thrive as a nation, corporations can still be profitable and they can pay people enough so they can work one job and take care of their families and save enough so their kids can do better than they've done. Let me just squeeze one last question. I'm enjoying this so much, but I've got my friend Michelle de la Isla, the mayor of Topeka, is a totally cold person too, but I like, I you know, enjoy you both so much. But one last question, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in what we do with leaders like yourself and such huge memberships to, to, to kind of seed empathy, seed the notions of inclusion. You know, you've helped set up the Lavender Caucus among, you know, in the, in the Lavender, you know, LGBT rights. And, and, and just be honest, you know, LGBTQ rights have been something that have come on later. You know, there were, you know, people sit in silos with whatever right they may care about, but they may not know that there are folks across the way. How do you help manage that so that you get folks to realize that someone else's advancement of rights can also help secure their own? I think by recognizing uh, the fullness of everybody's lives and not operating only on wages and benefits, but understanding that in the 70s and 80s, the reason we founded the Lavender Caucus is because LGBTQ people inside our union we're sitting at bargaining tables and wanting to be included in the health care coverage that was prohibited by law or wanting to be able to grieve the person they lived with for the past 30 years, whether they called them a partner, a spouse, whatever. Um, they were family and the rest of the union having enough depth of relationship with that person to say, hey, yeah, that's not right. And so the labor movement cut a lot of new ground on uh, wages and benefit extension to the LGBT community way before we started passing laws. And that's true in every area. Our janitors are bargaining over ending sexual harassment and assault on the night shift. Uh, we've had nurses fighting for mentally ill and homeless getting the benefits they need, especially during uh, the pandemic. All of our members fight on behalf of our immigrant members who are being threatened with deportation by the current policies of this administration because they want to end temporary protected status. And so if we um, can build multiracial organizations like unions, if we can write in people into the economy mm -hmm. and democracy, our relationships with each other, um, Steve, make us want to do right by each other. Mm -hmm. and. That's, for me, mm. the beauty of the union is that we can bargain over wages, hours, and working condition, but we also can build cross-racial solidarity and, and gender solidarity so that men see the advancement of women in their mm. self-interest as well um, and make gains at the bargaining table that we then can turn into policy change at every level of government. Well, look, this is so cool. I'm going to try and do something here for just a minute. Be, be patient. But, you know, I, I, I originally, you can see behind me, we're calling this Century of the Woman. I originally wanted to call it Outrageously Awesome Women, which I consider you, Mary Kay Henry. But I also have my friend Michelle De, De La Isla, uh, the mayor of Topeka, Kansas, um, who's become uh, a good friend and overcome so much in her life. And I just, you know, I like introducing people. So I want to introduce you. This is Michelle De La Isla. This is Mary Kay Henry. You're very high on my chart list. Uh, uh, and I think you're going to find a lot of things that resonate between the two of you. So, you know, this is this is my show. So um, I hope you um, uh, meet. But but Michelle, meet Mary Kay. 
it has been a delight to hear your conversation with regards to poverty wages, because that is one of the things that is really you know, holding people back in our economy. We cannot, at the same time that we argue that people are receiving assistance ship financially, complain when the basic wage that is supposed to be a living wage is not living in any of our states. So what you're saying was extremely poignant and I just love sitting here. I, I wish that you could have seen me nodding my head like a bobblehead the whole time <laughs> as you were speaking. What an honor to meet you, Ms. Henry. It's wonderful to meet you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership in Topeka. Well, Mary Kay Henry, thank president you. of SEIU, uh, thank you so much for your time uh, and, and your candid thoughts today. And we look forward to seeing you back here again soon. Good to be with you, Steve. Thank you.